Okay. <laughs> Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Yvette Cozier. I'm an associate professor in the epidemiology department, and I'm the assistant dean of diversity and inclusion for the School of Public Health. And I'd like to welcome you to our um, final DNI installment for the academic year, our Difficult Conversations series. Uh, the School of Public Health's mission is to improve the health of local, national, and international populations, particularly the disadvantaged, underserved, and vulnerable. We do this through education, research, and practice. In brief, public health requires us to work towards equality. To do so, we must understand the underlying structural barriers to equality, examine the patterns of health and disease, and focus on the most vulnerable, an approach which will lead us to difficult conversations along the way. Many of us approach the work of public health through a liberal or progressive lens, while others among us approach the work through a more conservative lens. Nevertheless, the two groups rarely engage in positive discourse, even though we have the same goal in mind. The topic of today's conversation emerged from the School of Public Health annual climate survey of faculty, staff, and students. A consistent theme expressed across all constituencies was the desire and the need to hear differing perspectives in our public health discourse and our public health approaches. It has raised the larger question of how do we address the health needs of the disadvantaged, underserved, and vulnerable when we hail from different political ideologies. So our discussion today, Red in a Sea of Blue, a Public Health Perspective, is intended to begin this dialogue and to begin the work of understanding the perspectives of those who approach the work of public health through varying viewpoints. I'd like to introduce our uh, panelists today. Um, first is Bob Flaherty. Mr. Flaherty is a member of the Dean's Advisory Committee for the Boston University School of Public Health. He's an operating partner of Berm, uh, with Berman Capital, a private equity firm, and advises them on acquisitions and trends in the medical industry. He has served as president and CEO of Athena Diagnostics Incorporated. He's been president of Becton Dickinson Medical, a unit of Becton Dickinson and Company and has served on the boards of directors for numerous comp companies, including Datatrack, International, Repromedics, uh, Atherotech, and the Chernobyl Children's Project, assisting children afflicted by the Chernobyl nuclear explosion. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree with honors in Industrial Engineering from Lehigh University and a Master in Business Administration from the Harvard Business School. Our second panelist is Hannah Kane, who is a representative um, and serves on the state representative for the 11th Worcester District, representing the towns of Shrewsbury and Westboro, precincts four and five, and was recently sworn into her third term uh, in January of 2019. She is a graduate of Boston University School of Man Management, um, now Questrom. Uh, she has significant experience in both the, the private and public sectors and was recruited to work with the Weld Salucci administration on the redevelopment of the former Devons Army Base. Among her many duties, uh, Representative Kane serves as a member of the Joint Committee on Ways and Means. She is the ranking minority member of the Joint Committee of, on Public Health and the ranking minority member of the Joint Committee on Cannabis Policy. She is also a member of the Central Massachusetts Opioid Task Force and the State Director for the National Women in Government Foundation, where she is a member of the Mental Health and Substance Use Task Force. She is also a founder and co-chair of the First in the Nation Food System Caucus. Finally, I'd like to introduce today's moderator, uh, Professor Nicole Huberfeld. She is an award-winning professor in health law, ethics, and human rights at the School of Public Health and professor at the law school um, at here at Boston University. Her scholarship focuses on the cross-section of health law and constitutional law with emphasis on the role of federalism in health care, especially Medicaid, and the federal spending power. She has authored law texts and has published in national and international journals, including Stanford Law Review, New England Journal of Medicine, Boston College Law Review, uh, and Vanderbilt Journal of Entertainment and Technology Law. Her work has also been cited by the Delaware Supreme Court, federal district courts, and by the US Supreme Court in the first Affordable Care Act case, 
NFIB versus Sibelius. I did remember what NFIB meant, but then I forgot it. So, <laughs> but, um, but uh, please uh, join me in welcoming our speakers. <laughs> so first, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Flaherty to give us his presentation. His presentation. Great, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, as you probably saw, I'm not a political science expert and uh, they've asked me to talk about what is inherently a, a political issue. So I'm just a businessman and um, retired and trying to help out a, a, in this area. So I hope you enjoy the presentation and that you'll have some interesting questions for me. It's a little bit of a how-to uh, deal with uh, issues, many of which you might find in, in business, but uh, and it's, uh, you know, I make some observations along the way, which hopefully you'll find a little thought provoking. So let's begin. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about these eight things. I'm going to start out with ants and Neanderthals. And uh, yes, there is really hope for humans. I'm going to look at how blue is the sea anyway. It's pretty blue. Blue and red, what are the differences? Many of you already know some of this. Why being red is being happy. Uh, talk about the July Red Conference in Washington, D.C., and then say, well, what's all this have to do with public health? And I'm going to go over three business techniques for advancing the public interest. And then I have a humorous trip at the end by uh, the god of the red, Ronald Reagan. So without further ado, let's move on. First of all, does anyone know what the so social secret is that humans share with ants? Uh, I did a little close-up. Can you see that? Does that give you any help? No. Well, the most significant thing is that ants and humans are alike in that they accept new members into their group with act without actually knowing the member. So, for instance, if you go into a restaurant and you're having dinner and another human walks into the restaurant, you don't get offended, right? So, and we've both built large communities of members in that way, and by building these large communities, we've been able to prosper. So, uh, we stick together for generations as well, you know, families and things like that, ants do the same. And we have markers or signals that allow us to accept new members into the group. So, for an ant, it's smell. An ant can go smells another ant and detect that it's an ant, and they immediately get it accepted into the community. And, you know, ants have made uh, great migrations up the West Coast and California and other places. And millions of them are similar. Uh, humans are the same, but the signals they use are a little different. Uh, sometimes they can be behavioral tics, like, or language things. If you're an Australian, you can tell the Australian accent. Sometimes the appearance, maybe it's clothing, like a MAGA hat or something. If you're at a Republican meeting, you're, those types of things, you're allowed to be accepted, even though they might not know the member. So, Think of the significance of this, but what about chimpanzees? Chimpanzees are, and, and lions for that matter, don't allow other members into their presence if they don't know them. They, know, they may know they're the same species, but if you come in, the, in contact with a group of chimpanzees and they don't know you, here's what happens. They'll very often kill the person who's coming in. So my, the reason I bring this up, aside from that I thought it was interesting when I read it, was that uh, Humans have a unique ability to get along, and based on that, we've made great progress over the millennia. Now, here's another one that I saw recently. It was Smithsonian Magazine. It talks about uh, Neanderthals. Now, as a kid, I, sometimes somebody would say, well, you're a Neanderthal. This was not taken as a, uh, as a compliment. It was really an insult. But the good news is that this article says that the, the uh, conventional wisdom has been upended, and Neanderthals really aren't as dumb as you thought, that they, they lived co uh, coincident with, the, uh, with humans, homo sapiens, and, um, you know, they, uh, they made contributions. They had artwork in caves. They had tools and very many things that homo sapiens did, and they hadn't been credited with that in the past. So my point here is even if, even if we humans have different points of view, there's still the possibility that those of us who we don't like or we don't uh, appreciate their political views, it, they could get rehabilitated if we would be more broad-minded about the subject. 
Uh, let's go on that, and I want to check out, give you a little insight into red and, red and blue. Uh, first of all, is it really red in a sea of blue? These are four maps from the, the 2016 uh, election for president. The first map is which states voted Democratic and which ones voted Republican. Well, the red is Republican. This one here is the uh, congressional districts that voted uh, Republican or Democrat. The blue ones are the Democrat. The one on the lower left are counties, that by county what the vote was. The blue is Democrat. And the, this uh, funny looking map over here, however, is a, is a different. It's not a geographical map. The, the, the sizes of the colors are based on population voting. And of course, we know that the last election, the popular vote was very close. In fact, Hillary Clinton actually got a few more votes than Donald Trump. But the question I'd ask is, oh, and here's another thing. Here's a, uh, wait, I gotta go on this one. The question I ask is, is, is this really red in a sea of blue, if we look at this, or is it blue in a sea of red? And I think what we need to look at, particularly those of us who live in Massachusetts, and me particularly in Brookline, is that there are a lot of people out there, in fact, half the population, who represent the red side, and another half represents the blue side. So the question is, how are we going to work in this kind of environment in order to make progress? Uh, this was a little out of sequence. This is uh, something I noted. Here's a woman, when you get old, universities send out things like this in anticipation of your demise in order to get you to commit in advance that when you go, you're going to give money to the university. Uh, your esteemed school, Boston University, I'm sure does the same, the same thing. But anyway, here's a woman graduated from Radcliffe in 1948. And she says now, she says, I felt like I had graduated from an institution that now truly reflects American society. Now, I wouldn't think of Harvard University as truly reflecting American society uh, based on that, that graph, I'd say. So I think we could pretty clearly say that this person is a sea of blue person, right? But God bless her. She's probably made a big donation. She did make a huge social contribution. She was a pioneer computer programmer supporting women in science, which is a very good uh, uh, credential to have, and that's one of the reasons she was featured. Okay, so what's the difference between uh, uh, of the blue and the red? Here's a way to look at it. The key principles of American conservatism are they want to protect and maximize individual rights. They want to ensure a limited government. They want to uphold the rule of law. They're committed to federalism and the separation of powers, meaning the states have certain powers, the federal government has certain powers, and the three branches of uh, the US government are separate and equal. And they want to maintain a free and open markets. Now, if we take a look at the key principles of liberalism, it's a little bit different. They feel the government role is to protect individuals from being harmed by others. And, and that's, a, uh, that's a worthy goal, although they do recognize that the government itself can pose a threat to liberty. They feel, all, they feel that freedom is threatened by private economic actors, such as businesses, like I was the CEO of two of them for many years, so I might, my, my business could be considered a threat, that exploit workers or dominate the government. And they advocate state action, including economic regulation, to reduce conditions like extreme poverty that hamper the exercise of individual rights. And lastly, they, many advocate broader rights, like a right to employment, a right to health care, and a right to education. So these are pretty, some pretty, pretty significant differences. Uh, and I think you could see why uh, bridging the gap sometimes is challenging. But Americans do like the concept of conservative. Let's not deny that. And some of the facts say that 40% of Americans and 20% of Democrats actually identify themselves as conservative. And 62% uh, of Americans and 40% of Democrats have a positive view of the word conservative. So it's not like being a conservative is, a, uh, is a, an odd person out there. It's not a unicorn. And I think people on the left and the right need to recognize that there are different points of view to be bridged. 
So uh, why is the generic philosophy so popular? First of all, Americans have a favorable view of the generic description of conservative. Here's a poll where 10 was extremely convincing, zero was not convincing at, at all, right? They asked this question. This is what they, they, they suggested. Read this statement and then vote. So the statement is, we need to limit government and create space where private institutions, individual responsibility, and religious faith can flourish. That means less economic regulation and lower taxes, but it also means a return to traditional, value, traditional moral values, support for families, and protecting the sanctity of human life. That was a statement that was read, and these are the results. Americans' average rating for this statement was just below 8 out of 10, where, eight, where 10 is extremely convincing. 39% of people gave it a 10. Democrats, 40% gave it a 10, and only 9% of Democrats gave it a negative score. So even people who are blue, many of them have, uh, many of them view this argument as, as, as an interesting one. So the question is, why is the philosophy so popular? And the generic philosophy of less government, lower taxes, free markets, strong military and family values, why is it popular? Because there's nothing wrong with it. Who wants more government than we need? Who opposes free market benefits? Uh, who opposes a strong national defense? Who's against morality? Conservatives are happy with this. They love it. They say, this is a great way to live. So if you want to learn a little bit more about the red side of the spectrum, here's a way to do it. This is a course put on by the Young Americans Foundation. It is available to any college or graduate student. This is the part that's amazing. It's a six-day course in Washington, D.C. The net cost to the students is $100. It includes the course, meals, and hotel. Obviously, the program costs more than that. And the reason is it's subsidized by uh, Young America for Freedom uh, supporters. Now, there's a requirement. If you go for the six days, you have to attend all, you have to attend all the courses. And if you do, it, the, the, you put up $500 to begin with. If you fulfill the obligations, you get a $400 refund. So the cost is, it costs $100 to go. It includes lectures, briefings. You meet leading conservative thinkers. You learn conservative principles. You become more effective advocate. You meet like-minded people nationwide. You learn how to bring speakers to your school. You, know, you get better speakers than me, you know, who people who actually know what they're talking about, right? For $100. And if you're interested, uh, there's a, it's, it's this summer, July 19th to August 3rd at the Renaissance Hotel in Washington. Renaissance is usually a Marriott hotel. Anyway, that's it. So what's that all, what's this all have to do with public health? Okay? So I'm going to tell you. I went back and I started looking at progressive agendas over time. And this, at the turn of the 20th century, this is what uh, progressives were worried about, which were good things. In fact, uh, my uh, family, were, believe it or not, I was half Italian, and my uh, grandmother, was, my grandfather was an Italian-speaking minister administering to Italian immigrants at the turn of the 20th century. And he had, brother, he had sisters who were missionaries who would go into the tenements in New York City to administer to the impoverished conditions that were there. So they were interested in promoting self, social welfare, reducing harsh conditions brought about by industrialization. They wanted to change the uneven balance of, health, of wealth between big business and government. They organized a socialist party. All these things are coming, coming, coming back, right? They were interested in economic efficiencies. Uh, they advocated time and motion studies. They wanted to promote moral improvement. They thought that improving the lives of the poor by improving their personal behavior, God forbid, would be uh, uh, valuable. They were interested in banning alcoholic beverages. You remember the women's Christian temperance movement was very big in that area. They opened kindergartens for Im immigrants. These were all initiatives that were taking place in the early part of the 20th century. And the... And some of those things, I think, continue with the progressive movement today. And, I, you know, they're all very worthy causes, as uh, I think most people, most Americans would agree, those are all wor worthy causes. So, and I said, well, let's take a look at public health initiatives. So I went to the CDC website, and uh, this is, these are the 
what they said were the most important public health problems. And I looked, I said, well, you agree with those, right? Alcohol-related, food safety, HIV, motor vehicle injuries, teen pregnancy, they're all important public health initiatives. But there's odd to me what there's no, there's no mention of things that I've been reading about in the pronouncements from the Boston University School of Public Health. You know, there's a lot of written material that's put out by you, and a lot of it talks about these kinds of things, right? And those are not listed as public health topics, but I think I agree, and maybe you do too, that I would say they are emerging topics today in public health. And these are relatively simple to deal with, I think, I would argue, in comparison to these. It requires much greater level of skill to de deal with these than the others, or to add these on to the difficulty and challenges of the other public health initiatives. So here's a, a quote from the esteemed dean here, you know, and he says something like, uh, Typical American conversation about health focuses on personal choice, and he says uh, the foods we eat, the numbers we sleep, et cetera, et cetera. But he says we need to think about it the other way, that it's much more complicated than that. Here's a kid. Uh, this, this says, this is Richard. His parents are doing OK. His house is warm and dry. His shelves are full of books, and his fridge is full of food. This is Paula, her parents not so much. Paula's house is full of people and not much else. It's damp and noisy and she keeps getting sick. So this cartoon goes on three or four more slides with the same, same, types, of, uh, uh, same types of things identified. And it's, um, it uh, shows that different kids start at different places, you know? I used to have a, uh, used to have a statement that says this guy, this guy thinks that he hit a home run, but he started on third base, right? The same kind of, same kind of concept. And I think that's what Dan, Dean Galeo is, is suggesting, that where you start has something to do with uh, where you end up. And this cartoon makes that point. So I looked, at, I looked again at a list of uh, what, what, are what are issues where conservatives and liberals have, have often have different points of view. And they were all listed in black. So then I said, well, which ones of those have, have some public health initiative, uh, some, something to do with public health, given the concept that I just presented that the subject is getting more complicated and more extensive? And I think all of those that I've highlighted in red are somehow related to public health initiatives. And many of them are things that I see in the writings that uh, professors and students put in the various uh, written materials that the school produces. So public health is getting to be, uh, you know, a very complicated matter involved in all manner of society and becoming extremely complex with new thinking. They may be orders of magnitude more complex in the future and getting results will be challenging. I mean, after all, you're in the, the trade of public health, right? You know, you're not writing great books that or uh, recording wonderful songs. You're in the business of getting results for public health. And you've got to be a lot better today than you were yesterday if you're going to make an impact. Otherwise, you're just going to be debating how many angels there are on the head of a pin, which is a metaphor for not getting anything done, of course. And this, I think, is a big challenge for the school and uh, for students who, uh, who work in the school. And you're not going to be able to do it unless you have persuasive arguments and you have persuasive techniques on how to deal with adversity and differences of opinion, like people who happen to have a red political persuasion. So what to do? Um, I used to say when somebody would come in and have this bold initiative, I'd say, you know, is this like boiling the ocean? And boiling the ocean is very challenging if you know anything about physics. So here's a woman uh, who is attempting to boil the ocean. I think you'd agree it's going to be a pretty hard job to boil the ocean. And uh, so how do we deal with issues of, uh, of uh, difference? Here's an approach. Does anybody know? Raise your hand if you know Saul Dialinsky. Have you ever heard of him? Oh, come on. Oh, yeah, there's one back there. All right, Saul Alinsky had a technique for, uh, he was a radical in the 1970s, and he had a technique for social change. 
And I would say this is a technique that's good where you have a, pa you have a path where you believe you can dominate the opposition. Very rare that, it, that you have that path, but he has a technique to do this. And this is the technique. He has 13 rules. I've highlighted three, uh, th four of the ones that I think are qu quite effective if you can pull them off. One is ridicule is man's most potent weapon. Keep ridicule on the other side. We have a little of that going on today. Haven't you seen that? If you will go to see it, I don't know if you watch TV or the news. I never did when I worked, but now I do because I'm not working. MSNBC and Fox News, you think you're talking about two different worlds, for God's sakes. And ridicule is a strong, it's a very strong part of the repertoire, both of them. Keep the pressure on, never let up. If you push a negative hard enough, it'll push through. Pick the target, freeze it, personalize it, and polarize it. These are very strong things to do. I, I say it's a little bit like uh, Roman gladiators. If you've ever been to the Colosseum in Rome, it's a pretty nasty place. It says, he's the enemy, get him on the ground, drive the sword through his chest, the winner gets the spoils. That's, that's the Olinsky technique, all right? I don't think that is a very effective technique to use unless you really have a powerful position. And even Al Gore agrees with that, right? Al Gore has said that, uh, he says this is a good quote. He made it at Harvard uh, last month. He says, the belief that free citizens can govern themselves wisely and fairly by resorting to logical debate on the basis of the best evidence available instead of on the basis of the exercise of raw power was and remains a simple premise of American democracy. Now, there's not too much that Al Gore says that people on the right agree with, but I think everybody on the right would agree with that statement. Okay, so uh, here's the second uh, technique, uh, second approach. And this, the point I want to highlight here is that if you're going to make progress, you need to have an unambiguous definition of what the problem is. And so many times, people don't come to an agreement on what the problem is before they want to launch into a solution. Because sometimes identifying the problem is a very painful thing, and it leads to a lot of confrontation. And Problem definition can lead very usefully, if done properly, to these steps, which are kind of the steps to move forward. These are not that hard, you know. Identify the alternatives. Which one do you pick? What strategy are you going to use? What implementation steps? How are you going to measure effectiveness? All those are, you know, you can hire guys like me to come in and, uh, and implement that kind of program. But identifying the problem really requires experts in the particular field to identify what is the nub of it. Because oftentimes, the problem that's identified is not really the problem. And I'll show you a few charts here to just illustrate that. Now, if you, don't, if you don't have the problem clearly identified and somehow you come up with a successful result, here's what I say. You're just lucky. Because most of the time, you won't be that lucky. So uh, this time sometimes works with people with, with similar interests, like a boss here. I was in that position. This guy's saying, profits are down, competition's up, someone's sticking gum under the chair, right? So these people kind of generally have the same goal in mind. They're working in a confined organization. There might be differences of opinion, but this particular technique can work very effectively in, in, that, in that regard. Uh, so here, what's the problem? This is, these are a few other maps. This one... Uh, talks about public health issues. You can see the mortality rates are higher in this, you know, Middle South, a little bit in Oklahoma, North Texas, maybe a little bit along the Georgia coast. It seems to mirror pretty closely obesity rates, right? High obesity rates. Now, curiously enough, car commuting rates. The people that have the highest car commuting rates seem to have the highest mortality and the highest obesity, right? So, and poverty rates, I looked at that, I thought maybe there'd be poverty, but poverty has a slightly different distribution. So would I be right to say that if we got, if we got people not to commute in their car so much, uh, there, uh, there'd be less obesity? I mean, is that the problem, that uh, we have too many people driving in cars? No. Uh, here's another one. Uh, this, this chart shows that if you're poor, you have a much higher likelihood of being obese than if you're wealthy, apparently. These are not my charts. I just took them off the internet. And poor people tend to be more, more uh, sedentary than wealthy people. 
And poor people tend to get more diabetes than wealthy people. So maybe, maybe you say, I think I missed the point here. Oh, yeah, the point I wanted to make here on this chart, I'm sorry, I forgot, is that you could say, well, let's give poor people more money so they're not so poor, and will that reduce obesity? I'm not sure. Maybe it would. We haven't tried it yet, right? And here we go. Poor, this is another one that says, uh, becoming overweight is a major cause of diabetes. High calorie consumption leads to weight gain. Uh, I know that because I live perilously close. You know that BMI chart they have, which shows normal, skinny, and obese? I am perilously close to the line, the obese line. I'm not going to tell you what side of the line I'm on, but I do know that when I get close to it, when I stop eating, I, I move away from it. So you might be able to say, and 30% of people are overweight, people have diabetes, 85% of diabetics are overweight. So maybe the cause of... Uh, of uh, Diabetes is uh, too much time at uh, McDonald's, right? So if we prevent people from going to McDonald's, is that, maybe that would be a better solution than giving, giving money. I don't know. Uh, the other, and, and one point I want to make here is be careful of these associations. Nothing is more irritating than people who make false associations in, in order to justify their position. I don't know if you know where the Bay of Fundy is. It's a, it's a bay between the Canadian mainland and Nova Scotia, and it has notoriously high tides. There's high tide, low tide, same, same view. And uh, so you could say here for bipolar disorder, you say, ha, huh, he doesn't have bipolar disorder. His daily up and down mood swings are related to the tides in the Bay of Fundy. Well, of course, there's no relationship between the tides in the Bay of Fundy and one's individual bipolar tendency, right? So it's a ridiculous analysis, but there are equally ridiculous associations that are made every day. The second thing I suggest you be careful of is you get, uh, particularly in academic environments, I would say, you get people who, you should be very suspicious when somebody says the data is clear. The data is rarely clear. And as good questioning people, I would always respond with, really? How so? So if you can make those, those two points, don't make false associations and don't accept on face value just because somebody says the data is clear. Third technique is getting to yes. This is good where people are, uh, have competing interests like a U.S. Congress. This guy uh, has a comment on the U.S. Congress. He's the senator from uh, Louisiana. He says, there's a reason why American people think Congress is born tired and raised lazy. And this guy's Kennedy. Of course, this fellow is saying this. He didn't say it. And here's uh, Joe Biden saying uh, he has a point of view. We're obligated to give health care to illegals. This is a, a person I know. She uh, teaches at NYU. She says, I'm tired of working, seeing my earnings eroded for everyone else in the world. This is why our vets aren't getting good care, right? So you would think these views are intractable. So this technique can be used when you're dealing with people who have two widely divergent points of view on the same subject. But it has four steps. One is separate people from the problem. You're trying to avoid arm wrestling. Build a working relationship. Be clear about what the issue is that you want to work with them on. Face the problem, not the people. Strive for a fair agreement. Sit on the same side of the table. So you're looking at the same set of facts. Two is, this is important, focus on the interests. Two people are sitting in a room where the window's open. One wants the window closed. The other one wants the window open. That's not their interest. That's the, that's the action. Their interest is fresh air. One, one person says, I want the window open because I have fresh air. The one, I want it closed because I don't want the draft. So the solution was open the window in an adjoining room. There's no draft and there's fresh air, right? So by focusing on interest rather than the actual issue, you can get to a, a, a satisfactory conclusion. Step three is basically invent options. Don't limit yourself to just a few options. Really work very hard to identify as many options as you can by an unrestricted brainstorming. Uh, and last, insist on using ob objective criteria. Have you ever had a conversation with somebody and you're making a point and you know it's a winning point and the person says, well, I just don't buy it or something like that? We all face that. So that's why you need to have objective uh, criteria. How do you do that? You know, what would a judge decide if it were in a court of law? It's one way of doing it. Maybe an issue is how much does it cost? Maybe, it's, uh, maybe you have a cost goal that you have to achieve. 
Maybe it's that it has to comply with the available data and documentation that's, uh, that's unavailable so that you agree in advance of how we're going to evaluate any option as we try to make progress on the issue that we've agreed that we're going to take, try to make progress on. Uh, this is a little clip here. I'm almost done. This is talking about listening, this is very important. Good advice for everybody, particularly young people, and particularly people who are violently opposed to a certain thing. So these are the points that I've made. I hope you've enjoyed them. I've got one more uh, humorous presentation from uh, Ronald Reagan, which uh, will close out my presentation. Okay, so that's it, I appreciate it. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to join you here today. I'm always excited to be with fellow Terriers. I'm quite often invited to speak on the topic of women in public service, and I typically begin my comments with the following statement. Never once in my life has it occurred to me to not do something because I was a woman. As I sat down to think about the program today, Red in a Sea of Blue, I kept coming around to the same similar thought. Never once in my life has it occurred to me to not do something because I was a Republican. My own belief set, formed not from a political party or party platform, but from my childhood and adult experiences, has always served as my moral compass. I grew up on a dirt road in southern Maine with two younger brothers, and I was a complete tomboy. One of our very good friends, uh, family friends, served as the minority leader in the Maine House of Representatives, and he gave me opportunities in the summer to serve as a page in the State House, passing notes back and forth between the legislators. This is where I first experienced the thrill of being in the midst of legislators discussing and debating important policy issues. In high school, my father served in President Reagan's Department of Education, and my family resided in Fairfax, Virginia. In Maine, I had attended a high school with 400 kids. In Fairfax, Virginia, there was a kid of 40, uh, high school of 4,200 kids I went to, and another one just a few miles away with 6,000 kids in it. It was a sea change for me, and a welcome one. It prepared me for a much more diverse world than the one I had been exposed to growing up in Maine. 
At a young age, I knew I had a strong desire to serve someday in public office, fueled by my belief that the political arena today is the history lesson of tomorrow. And I was galvanized by women leaders I saw and I respected. After graduating from BU School of Management, I started my professional career at Unum Insurance Company in Portland, Maine, before accepting an offer from the Lieutenant Governor Paul Salucci, a Republican and a family friend, to return to Massachusetts and help transition Fort Devens from a closing military base to a thriving business community. It was also there that I met my husband, Jim Kane, who was serving as a Deputy Chief Policy Advisor to Governor Weld and Lieutenant Governor Salucci. The late Governor Salucci, a man who was well respected on both sides of the aisle, was a mentor and a role model for both my husband and myself. His political advice to me to be mindful of the caretaking of personal relationships and that policy and political decisions should never interfere with those personal relationships has served me well throughout my career. Paul Salucci also understood the power of opportunity and that even opportunity stemming from a personal challenge can be useful. His efforts to raise uh, significant funds and awareness of ALS before he succumbed to it way too young uh, significantly advanced research at UMass. After several years in mass development, I returned to the private sector serving as a vice president for a consulting firm. Many mornings I was on the first flight out of Logan to see clients. With my first two daughters born and the weight of 9-11 on my mind, I decided to stay at home and to serve the community for a number of years while I could do so while they were young. My husband was then serving as the deputy director of the National Republican Governors Association and we had an apartment in DC that my husband lived in Monday through Thursday in our house at home. We were very lucky to be able to enjoy the political life in DC and a family life in Shrewsbury. In 2009, my husband, who had previously served three terms as a city councilor in Marlboro, decided to run for selectman in Shrewsbury and I chaired his race. Following this race, I then chaired or led eight successful political races, including selectman state committee and my business partner's state rep campaign along with co-chairing a debt exclusion to build a new middle school and pass an operational override in Shrewsbury. Previous debt exclusions and operational overrides in Shrewsbury had failed on the first try every time. The overrides had failed eight times in a row. Many advised me at the outset that taking on these two races that just weren't winnable and that I would ruin my own reputation. Yet what I had gleaned by observing town politics for several years were that the campaigns that began with an opening salvo of you're either with us or against us, and they went downhill from there. <clears throat> the people who had recently moved to town, generally younger and more liberal, blamed the seniors and longtime residents, who they believed to be more conservative, for voting down much needed new schools. I pulled the voter rolls and informed my peers that the losses had a lot more to do with their lack of voting than it did with the seniors voting against new schools. I also stressed to proponents that these decisions were largely financial ones and that their emotional tactics were counterproductive to the method they needed to gain support. The facts were compelling enough and simply needed to be conveyed. I altered the message and showed people that we could either invest a little less money in renovating an existing school and get only a few short more years out of it, or invest a little bit more money and get ourselves a 50 to 60 year solution. It was a far better investment to spend a few more dollars. When the choice became a financial one, not you either care about kids or you don't, it was a much easier one for people to make and we won that on the first try with a 57-43 margin. The override passed a few years later by a two-thirds margin using the same tactics. The important skill set of listening and message discipline, which are largely absent or undervalued in today's 24-hour entertainment-driven bloodbath of politics, was key to our success and it was a model that I was committed to. We did not tell people what to think. We didn't say, either you think this or else. We provided them with information and presented the choice in an easy to understand, factual way that did not question their own belief system, but instead built on it. I believe that if you respected the fact that everyone is where they are in life from the sum of their own personal experiences, beliefs, and education, then you don't see people as opposing you or your beliefs, and you value them from where they are while you seek to find common ground from which to build. Why do I share this with all of you? Because it's the same approach that I took to Beacon Hill when elected. I understood I was entering an arena where I was a mi minority member on two fronts. Women held only 25% of the seats and there were only 40 Republicans in the 200 member legislature. Today, I am one of only seven Republican women at the State House among my 200 colleagues. This presents both a challenge and an opportunity for me. Many people ask me what it's like to be on Beacon Hill being in the minority party. 
I often surprise folks who inquire by saying that when you are elected, Beacon Hill is a lot less about the R and the D, and it is much more about who wants to get work done versus who's simply enamored with themselves and their new title. In 2015, one of my constituents and a school committee member at the time in Westboro was deeply concerned about the much discussed potential of a ballot question to legalize recreational marijuana. This issue had not been on my radar screen at all as a priority, but her concern led me to look deeper into the issue. I read the 24-page ballot question language and became concerned myself about the lack of public health protections and public safety measures. I listened to the proponents position the ballot question as a way to regulate and tax marijuana, but I believe the real intent of the business plan written ballot question was to commercialize marijuana, grow the market size, and to be hugely profitable. I recognize this being a business major from BU. Working together with Governor Baker, Speaker DeLeo, Boston Mayor Marty Walsh, Attorney General Maura Healy, Senator Jason Lewis, and myself, we formed a bipartisan group opposed to question four. We wanted to educate the voters on what passage of the ballot question language would mean in terms of implementation and what we saw as the deficiencies. I solicited support from my legislative colleagues, and 121 of them out of 200 joined us in opposing the question, a bipartisan and bicameral team. We didn't come together to oppose the question on philosophical grounds. In fact, some of the folks opposing the ballot question were indeed for the legalization of marijuana. But rather, we joined together to illustrate our belief that this was not well-constructed policy, and it had glaring deficiencies, particularly in the public health realm. While question four did indeed pass in 2016, the bipartisan effort brought, much, brought the race to a much narrower margin, allowing for enough political will to still exist on Beacon Hill to allow for the passage of an omnibus bill that provided additional public health, public safety, and local control measures without deviating from the original will of the people. This effort provided a high profile example of how people from across the political spectrum could find common ground and work together but it is not the only example of this on Beacon Hill within the public health realm. In the past few years, we've passed with bipartisan support legislation to raise the minimum age of purchase for tobacco products to 21. We've banned people under age 18 from using tanning beds. We passed the extreme risk protection order bill in an attempt to prevent gun tragedies. And several landmark pieces of legislation have passed to turn the tide on the opioid epidemic. While I'm a member of the minority party on Beacon Hill, my voice is heard and my input is sought because of the tone and tenor by which I conduct myself, and I am not alone. The Speaker of the House has more than sufficient members of the Democratic Caucus to pass any legislation he wishes to bring to the floor. With only 32 Republican members of the House, we do not even have enough membership to sustain a Republican governor's veto. We would require 54 members to do so. Yet by the time the legislation is brought to the floor to be voted on, at the Massachusetts House of Representatives, it has generally been strenuously vetted and consensus has been achieved, enough so that bipartisan support is almost always present. Surprised by this? I wouldn't blame you. The 24-hour news cycle and social media do not highlight or report often on the work that we do together, where conservatives and progressives find common ground with the moderate middle. This is even more glaring at the federal level. As news outlets and media platforms struggle for eyeballs and rating margins, they avoid significant reporting on good old-fashioned effort of working together on important issues. The same week of the vote last October in the Senate to confirm Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court, the Senate took up a major piece of legislation aiming to address different aspects on the opioid epidemic. It passed the Senate, the U.S. Senate, 98 to 1, and it was lauded by prevention and public health advocates. Despite 72,000 people in our country losing their life each year to this epidemic, I only heard about this near unanimous legislation passing because I happened to be in DC and on Capitol Hill that week. I'm not a partisan person. I don't like labels. I love collaborating and I love progress. I believe labels are unfortunately used as a shortcut by people to avoid the effort of actually understanding what, how, and why people think the way they do on an issue. There is no collective group think on any one issue at the State House. There are more moderate Democrats who agree with more moderate Republicans on many issues to the dismay of most conservative and progressive members of the House. There are other issues where conservative members and progressive members are aligned and the moderate middle is not. Labels give you no real insight into a person's belief system. Even when one chooses a label, 
whether it's conservative, progressive, Democrat, liberal, Republican. It should only be viewed as a directional signal, not a conclusive conversation-stopping barrier that prevents engagement and discussion on issues. Far too often, people incorrectly believe that a difference of opinion on one issue must mean an inability to see eye to eye on any issue. Or even worse, that someone who labels themselves differently than you has nothing to offer you. Some of my most informative conversations have been with people whose life experiences and perspectives are very different than my own. I seek these opportunities out, and it certainly makes me a better legislator and a better person. And my Republican label doesn't tell you anything, really, about who I am. I have two, a daughter who has two chronic diseases, arthritis and Crohn's. Her experience is what compelled me to file legislation creating a rare disease advisory council, as I cannot imagine the difficulty of patients, families, and the medical community encounter facing these diagnoses and still pursuing treatment when they are so rare. You don't know that my fourth child was stillborn, and that I'm appalled by the substantial and persistent disparities in maternal death rates by race and ethnicity, and that I co-sponsored a bill to create a special commission relative to reducing racial disparities in maternal deaths. You don't know that my grandfather and my father-in-law died of cancers prevalent among lifelong smokers, of which they both were, and that I co-sponsored the Tobacco 21 legislation as I do not want to see another youth lured into a lifelong addiction and early death. You don't know that my middle daughter is gay and that I proudly voted for the transgender public accommodations bill years prior to knowing this, as I believe all people should have the same civil rights and anything less is simply unjust. You don't know that my mother taught fifth grade and at her class in Jack Elementary School in Portland, Maine, she had to perform weekly lice checks. She had to go to houses to try to track down the parents to provide the first quarter report. And that each year she brought her class out for the day to our home in the country where we had horses and dogs and cats. And that for many of these kids, it was their first time out of the city. And you don't know that Jack Elementary School had to be closed in 2001 and was later torn down as a result of mold con contamination that sickened everyone there. You don't know that throughout my life, I've seen so many who have struggled with access to enough food to sustain themselves. You don't know that my grandparents experienced this during the Depression, or that the children that I see when I was PTO president in Shrewsbury on the free or reduced lunch program trying to sneak more food onto their plate or to the many families and elderly who were served by our food pantries in the district, the struggles that they have. Those experiences led me this past January to co-found and co-chair the first in the nation food system caucus with five of my Democratic colleagues. Within two months, our membership has grown to 77 members of the legislature, the second largest caucus after the Democratic caucus, of course. Our bipartisan bicameral caucus has, as one of its three priority areas, food access and insecurity. You would know none of this and no doubt never suspected this had you assessed my perspective, my, my perspective, my interest, and my value based solely on my Republican label. Nor would you have likely guessed after knowing what I've told you today that I do also have a high approval rating among the American Conservative Union for the last two sessions. I hope that what you've gleaned from my remarks this afternoon, though, is that labels are an inaccurate metric that far too often hinder people's willingness to engage in productive dialogue and prevent meaningful policy solutions from forming. Thank you. Well, thanks to both of you for your remarks. They were uh, thoughtful and enlightening, and I think that they were exactly in the spirit of this day, which is that at any great university, what we're seeking is inquiry. And we can't engage in inquiry if we don't have the space to ask questions. And so I'd like to start us off by asking some questions, but then we'll open it up to the audience. 
So I want to start really broad, if you don't mind. And I want to ask you to sort of each oh, briefly, <laughs> too many things in my lap. Thank you. Each briefly tell us what public health means to you. <laughs> Not to your political party, but to you. You know, for me, I think one of the, the chief reasons that government exists other than national security is to ensure that there is a safety net for people when they need it. And that is a critical focus for me. I see public health being a component of that. Um, I much prefer the public health work to be on the preventative side of things. I'm a big proponent for putting dollars into preventative measures. It makes a lot more sense financially to do so because otherwise we're paying some enormous factor of that on the backside. Um, but for me, public health is one of the uh, key promises that we make to people that live in this country, um, that you're going to have access to good public health services. And so I spend a lot of time making sure that the work that I'm doing is helping ensure that that happens for the residents of the Commonwealth. Thank you. Well, I would say uh, public health to me means prevention. Uh, I spent my whole career in providing products for basically for therapy of people who have uh, contract different diseases. And uh, we spend massive amounts of money. It's up to 18% of the gross national product in this country. Almost one in five dollars is spent on health care. Uh, it took me 15 minutes to get a parking space in the garage, which is one indication of how much we spend on health care. And we spend a relatively small amount on prevention, which I think is what I, how would I see public health being. If we take the right steps for health before people get sick, we're going to do a lot better in terms of cost and uh, prosperity for our people than uh, without it. So uh, that's what public health means to me, and I hope we can encourage more funding for it and less funding for acute diseases if we have to make a balance. Would either of you say that your political viewpoint shapes your vision of public health? And if so, how? I don't know what my political viewpoint is. I, I don't, I, I've never approached anything thinking about it, what's the political expedient way to do something. I've, I've approached it, and again, I, I, I give a lot of credit to the education I received in the School of Management about how to think about problems, how to think about challenges that exist. Um, and I attempt to um, apply that thinking to any problem that comes before us. In public health, uh, I'm not an expert in public health. I didn't go to school for public health. Um, I'm the ranking minority house member on public health. Um, and so I think it's my responsibility to ensure I know what I'm talking about when things are coming up in public health. So I do a lot of research. I spend a lot of time talking to people. I spend a lot of time talking to diverse audiences who have very different opinions on things and questioning them, trying to make sure that I can net out uh, what do I believe is the, is the right path forward. Um, but I think you know, a commitment to ensuring that you are hearing from everyone is a critical piece of that. It is never um, healthy to surround yourself with people who think only like you do. And so I guess my political viewpoint is the responsibility end of this job to make sure you're doing all the work to get to what is the right path forward or what is the solution for the problem in front of us. Well, I would say that uh, some of my views of public health are, are uh, is, is not so much related to my political persuasion. I, I'm an independent. I, I may be a little bit right of center. I do believe in self-reliance. I think uh, that's important. But as I said earlier, some people start in third base and think they hit a home run. So, But I think it takes, uh, it takes good funding to make good pro programs. Uh, sometimes you can uh, bring a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. We need to have good programs that persuade people that public health, that their own personal health is in their best interest, and we got to create the uh, mechanisms whereby that can occur. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Representative Kane, you raise an interesting point. People say that we live in the era of information. But it also seems sometimes that we live in the misinformation era. So do you have any tactics for dealing with the amount of misinformation that seems to exist? 
it, it's, a, it's a real issue. I have um, a daughter who just graduated high school, one who's going to be a senior, and an eighth grade son. And I worry about this generation growing up without an ability to be able to decipher what is um, information you can trust versus what is being fed to you um, from one advocacy organization or one proponent group or another. Um, and, and I'm not sure that we have all the tools that we need yet to do that. Um, I found it really easy growing up to have only the NBC, ABC, and CBS News on um, and the one paper that was delivered to the house per day. That's how I received my information. That's how my parents did growing up. Um, I don't know what the uh, solution is to um, figuring out how to decipher it, but I do know that being able to ask critical questions, ensuring that you're not taking anything at face value, that you are uh, looking at multiple sources is always an important part of it. And again, you know, on Beacon Hill, the legislative process is always criticized as taking a very long time. I generally don't disagree with that, but I will tell you, having a very deliberative process and approach ensures that all voices have the opportunity to come forward and be heard. Um, and I think that is also uh, really important for people when they're receiving information, that they're not just using one source. Um, I watch a couple different TV uh, shows during the day. I start my day with Morning Joe. I like that show in the morning. In the afternoon, I might have something else on, and I might have the, a different news station on in the car. I try and immerse myself with a bunch of different points of view from, from trusted sources. But I also know that there is still, uh, even if it's news, there is a slant that occurs uh, no matter. And, and it can be completely not, um, they're not trying to necessarily slant it in one way. They get, again, it's their own perspective that they've grown up with, and that's how they're delivering it. Um, but I definitely think it's a challenge to determine what sources out there are reliable and factual news sources. Bob, what about you? How do you deal with misinformation? Well, um, first of all, on the subject of our, uh, our elected officials, uh, I have the view that they must have more uh, reasoned view of the facts than the news broadcasters are portraying to us. Uh, I can't imagine that they're so terribly concerned about being elected that they're, uh, uh, you know, just behaving with, with that in mind and pontificating about their various political views to pander to their constituents. But you saw that quote I had from the distinguished senator from Arizona. Why do Americans think uh, Congress was, what was it, born stupid and raised lazy? Is it because there's really no evidence that our legislators are working with our best interests if you, if you listen to the news broadcasts? But I do believe they have the right information. Uh, they certainly have the money to obtain the right information. And I would encourage them to use the third technique that I described up here in terms of identifying the issues that they want to work on together. And I was very interested in hearing your comments that this seems to be working better on the Massachusetts level than it seems to be from the news on the national level. But I would encourage you as a future uh, well, you're all citizens, but future voters and leaders that you do have to challenge what you hear. Um, people who say the data is clear be very suspicious of those characters because they often have an angle, an ax to grind. And, um, you know, make sure you don't fall into the trap of believing false associations. But you have to be smart. And with all this information that's available now on the Internet, uh, you have to be very skeptical of what you read. I mean, don't take anything at face value would be my suggestion. So Representative Kane, you've, you've mentioned a few times that you have found that once you enter the state capitol that the hats for Republican and Democrat sort of fall away. And so I'm wondering if you can provide examples to us of the kinds of public health goals that are shared by representatives or members of the Senate on both sides of the aisle. Sure. I mean, I, I think there is a shared belief by many of us that the preventative work is a far better investment uh, with a far better return. You see that in a lot of different areas. Um, the slides that Bob had up there before that spoke to uh, some of the, you had I think listed as crime issues, but I would say criminal justice. There are many issues there. 
um, and on the homelessness where we understand that especially early trauma in, in young kids can put them on a path that uh, is very unfortunate in life. So there's a lot of us that believe investing significant dollars in uh, helping ensure that our children have um, a good start in life. They are uh, in healthy family situations. They have access to the food that they need, the medical care that they need. Um, and then they start to learn at an early age. We know that those things are, a, by large, a very large predeterminant of their eventual um, health in life. And so I think that um, in Massachusetts, you have seen us do many things. I mentioned some of them, but uh, we have put our dollars into ensuring that we start out with our kids as, when they're born and try and give them the best platform they have in life. Um, but, you know, as I said earlier, many of the bills that come before us to be voted on in the State House um, have overwhelming bipartisan support. Um, I will also tell you, though, that out of 6,000 bills that get filed each legislative session, only about 4 to 5 percent of them become law. So there is an enormous amount of uh, bills that are out there that don't have any traction to get anywhere. It doesn't mean that they're bad bills. Part of it is a function of capacity. but. I do believe um, there's more work we could be doing in each session than we are currently doing. I also somewhat attribute that to not being enough women there. Um, I think that uh, women tend to do a better job of multitasking, so <laughs> I'm hopeful that eventually uh, we'll be able to get more work done. Um, but Thank you. Bob, did you want to add anything? Do you see no. public health issues that span both sides of the aisle? Well, yeah, I think uh, the issues, if you look at any of those uh, things that are called public health issues, um, everybody would be concerned about them. You know, everybody's concerned about the measles epidemic. I read this morning there's a thousand people with measles. So, you know, do you force people to have uh, vaccinations and impede their rights or uh, you allow them not to have vaccinations and we have a measles outbreak? So, I mean, I think that's... Um, you know, one might argue there's a political angle to that, you know, individual freedom versus not and the public good. But I think all of those issues, most people would appreciate that they are problems. The, the question is how to deal effectively with them. And you have to understand the interests of both, both sides of the spectrum, the people involved in the decision making on that. And if we do a better job at that, I think we'll, we'll come up with, uh, you know, legislation and... Uh, and solutions that will benefit. But both sides are very powerful. You know, the, the left is not going to overwhelm the right, maybe in Massachusetts. You may remember Massachusetts was the only state that voted for George McGovern in, in the Nixon campaign in 1972. So Massachusetts is a little different, you know. But the, you know, nationally, the red is not going to murder or kill the white, or the, the, uh, the blue, or, or verse, vice versa. We really have to find ways to identify common interests. But I don't think there's any question that both uh, the left and the right would acknowledge that those areas that are listed as public health problems are really problems. Can I just add something to that? Please. Again, I think that, and I speak of this more on the national level than I do in, in Massachusetts, but um, many years ago, uh, people stayed in Washington, D.C. for chunks of time. They were there for weeks or months to work on legislation. They weren't back and forth to the district on a plane every other day. One of the things that has happened is um, with the need to raise significant dollars to try and stay in office and um, needing to go back to the district to do that, you're no longer in Washington, D.C., so you're transactionally there. You're there to do something, but you're not there for the benefit of being able to go out and get a bite to eat with some of your colleagues or uh, to have a softball team or a baseball team. Um, and also the, the onslaught of the 24-hour news cycle um, means that, you know, you are almost always captured in some way, shape, or form um, when you are speaking. And if you have a bad day or you say a wrong thing or you, you're, you just screwed up, you didn't really mean to say it the way that you did it, but it came out, those things get captured in, in perpetuity and used against you. So um, for people who operate in the Washington, D.C. area at the Capitol, they no longer have the ability to really form relationships 
I have relationships, strong relationships with my colleagues because I know who they are. I understand what motivates them and why they ran and what their biggest concerns are. A lot of those people don't have the time to develop relationships like that. And then with the ability to broadcast images and statements of everything, those very quickly can get taken out of context. And now you simply have something that is out there that can be used against you in a way that really was not ever your intention of when you spoke it. Um, and you can never really get it back in the bottle. So it's really difficult to operate in environments where you have so much pressure put on you um, in those two capacities. How much time do you spend at Beacon Hill in a given year? Um, the interesting thing about this, this role as state rep is I probably spend as much time, if not more time, in the district working on problems and issues and meeting on things or um, I'm on a number of different special commissions that are looking into things that were, the commissions were formed legislatively and they're, were due back with recommendations on how to solve the problems. I just did one on uh, the regional transit authorities um, in Massachusetts. I'm on another one on local and regional public health. Um, those take a lot of work. The actual time at the State House, um, I, I spend time there when I need to spend time there. When I don't need to be there for some reason, I am typically back um, in the district um, and, and serving the constituents in that capacity. Mm -hmm. But this is a job that different people can do different things. I have colleagues who choose to uh, still work in other professions and they come in and vote and they, you know, they, they leverage it that way. You can put as much or as little into this position as you choose to. Ultimately, every two years, the voters in everyone's district gets to decide whether or not that works for them. Right. So. Um, this was mentioned earlier in, in Bob's talk and I think comes up relatively regularly in conversations about politics that the Republican Party often expresses a desire for smaller government. Uh, and I wonder how this approach to governance is compatible with public health goals and methods. And I wonder if each of you could speak to that. I'll go first. Well, a smaller government does not necessarily mean ineffective government. I think uh, people on the right would say there's a lot of waste that could be wrung out of systems, right? I think public health could get more funding as a percentage of the total pie. I think uh, the right would say we should eliminate uh, things that are unnecessary. There are even whole government bureaucracies that the right thing should be eliminated. Money, much of that could be spent on public health initiatives. So. I think um, the right probably has a view of live within your means. Uh, the right probably, t you know, the wealthy people, you know, pay, pay most of the taxes in this country, yet they're ridiculed for not paying their, their fair share. You know, the top 1% of the population pays 35% of federal income tax. 53% of the population pay no federal income tax. So. Um, probably we'd do better if there was more gratitude given to the wealthy people who pay all the taxes. Uh, but I don't see it necessarily inconsistent. I think that sometimes the left is accused of just adding on programs. Everything is to add more expense rather than find ways to transfer expense. So for instance, if you're in a business and you want to entertain a new initiative, it, it has to be profitable for you. So you, you, you're constantly relieving yourself of some expenses while you put other expenses on. Our government doesn't seem to uh, do that as effectively as uh, independent businesses do. Of course, businesses go bankrupt if they don't do it properly. Governments don't. So for me, the, the lens by which I look at uh, government is it being as efficient, as effective as, policy, as possible. Um, when Charlie Baker and Karen Polito were running for governor and lieutenant governor, um, there is a, a housing project that is uh, near me in Shrewsbury, it's in Worcester, a Great Book Valley housing project. There are families that have lived in the housing project and been on welfare for five generations. That to me is not government being efficient or effective. Um, the safety net that exists there hasn't bounced those people back it has led to generation after generation believing that is their lot in life. So for me, that's government not working. That, we have not helped those people find a path to being um, out of a poverty situation and on their own two feet. 
Um, I say all the time, you know, people think Republicans don't like to spend money. I have no problem spending money. I just want to make sure when we're spending money, we're getting the return on the investment we expected. And that's not just in a numerical form. That's in a, are we changing people's lives in the way in which we promised ourselves we would if we spent these dollars? So um, I get most concerned about government when we continue to creep and add on programs when the existing programs that we have are not being as efficient and effective as they should be, and they're not meeting the promise of the original intention of it. Why don't I ask one more and then we'll open it up? So as you're probably aware, this school in particular, this School of Public Health, is outwardly focused. We encourage civic engagement. We encourage um, public health advocacy. We think about how to be social justice advocates. And uh, sometimes the school itself may espouse a left-leaning position, for lack of a better way of describing it. And so I have a, a couple of questions given that lead up. One is, do you have practical advice to offer to students who may be, feel as if they don't necessarily fit within the school's choice? And the second is, um, how can you give advice to our students to participate in that advocacy in the most broad-based way possible so that everyone comes along? Well, um, <laughs> that's interesting. Uh, first of all, you should be proud of your point of view. Uh, with your colleagues, you shouldn't suppress or like them less because they have, they have a different point of view than you. Uh, you should respect other people's point of view and find out why they have that point of view and what, what interests do they have that would make them different than your interests. Uh, the whole word, word advocacy has a certain uh, confrontational tone to it. And, uh, you know, I really don't advocate uh, that as much as finding ways to collaborate. And um, you talk, this fellow Saul Linsky that I talked about, that was a very popular technique. It's, you know, let's overcome our adversaries. And it results in, in acrimony and lack of effectiveness. If you try to focus on what are the interests of the people on the other side and how to come to <coughs> solutions that serve the interests of both sides, uh, without trying to overwhelm the other side, I think you make a lot more, a lot more uh, progress. And as a student, that's a skill that I, if, for those of you that are students, that's a skill you really should attempt to develop. Advocating is pretty easy. You know, just follow Saul Alinsky or any other, person, any other group that says, I have a technique for getting your point across or uh, forcing the, or, uh, you know, talking loudly about it or making speeches or going to rallies. I was down on the Boston Common with a sign, you know. I've carried signs when I was younger myself during the Vietnam War, I should say. But um, the hard part I found in life and in business is establishing the collaborations with other people so that you can come to conclusions and solutions to move your organization forward. And if you don't have that, it's easy to carry signs and yell obscenities. It's very hard to establish personal relationships with people and come to some common understanding. And uh, when I hear things on college campuses of being shouted down because of the point of view that you have, it's just totally contrary to collaboration and coming to common understandings. And it makes me worry that students of today are never going to accomplish anything because they won't with those attitudes. Because you're not going to overwhelm the other side. They're just not going to give in. When, uh, when my husband ran for Selectman the first time, he had two men who were running with him that, you know, there was three of them uh, for one seat, and my husband beat both of them. Um, I ran my husband's campaign, and when I uh, decided to run for state representative, I sought the support of the two men that we had beat, uh, and they both supported me. And that was because they, they knew um, the tone and tenor that I used was about, you know, thinking through 
why my husband was the best candidate in the race, and it had nothing to do with the other two gentlemen. It wasn't pointing out their deficiencies. It wasn't trying to pinpoint them as not being you know, good people who wouldn't also serve well. It was just an attempt to uh, illustrate why we thought my husband was the, the, the best person in the race. And for me, that's actually one of the, the proudest things that I have is that we were able to um, win a race and races are competitive and yet not lose um, the friendship and the ability to seek support in other endeavors. And I think that when you think about um, advocating and things that are important to you, you always have to keep in mind that um, you may not be aligned with somebody on one aspect of what you're doing or, or one thing that's important to you, but they may be a great collaborator on another aspect of something that you want to work on at another point in your life. Um, but ensuring that you're open to hearing diverse points of view. I think people who are not open to hearing diverse points of view actually don't have enough um, strength in the merit of their own argument to hear it. I think it's a lot more about questioning, you know, do I really know what I'm talking about, if you're unwilling to listen to other people. Um, many times when I've listened to other people, one of two things has happened. My own reason for believing something has been strengthened or it's been altered. And it's been altered in a way because I either got new information or I saw it in a different way that I was unable to see before because of my experiences or the information that I had. But I have always walked out of every single conversation I've had with people who didn't naturally agree with me feeling that it was time worth spent well. Being in a minority party and being a minority member also means I have a responsibility on, on me to speak up, though. Um, because there are only 32 Republicans, I feel that it is always my responsibility when I am with my colleagues to also um, have a point of view or to bring up what I think as might be constructful comments to the conversation. Um, I think sometimes when you are in a minority situation, um, you need to create your own space to have a voice into that. Um, so I think it, there's a responsibility on both sides. Um, you have to allow people to have a different opinion than you, and you should seek it out. And if you are in a minority position, you also have to have the bravery to be able to put your point of view out there. We're glad to take audience questions. I think that there's a microphone that we need to use because the acoustics are a little funny. So if you would like the microphone, if you would please just raise your hand, and we'll bring it around to you. If you've had me in class, you know I've got plenty more to go, but I don't think you need more from us. We want to hear from you. Hi. Um, so first, thanks very much for being here, and Rep King, I especially appreciate you being here. I, I pre particularly appreciate the things that you had to say because on the committee that you and I have a chance to work on together, I get a chance to hear, to see you in action. And indeed, the things that you've described or your way of behaving is exactly the way you act in, in our committee. So I applaud you for the things that you have to say. And thank you very much for actually living those things as you, uh, as you do them on the committee that we work on together. Thank you. So my question is really about looking for more specific kinds of examples. So there are times in being in the Republican Party or being in the minority party where there may be views that are different than, are, than others. And, and you've talked a good deal about areas of collaboration. And I really appreciate hearing that. But could you also talk about areas where you really diverge from the, from the larger part of the population of folks in the legislature? And, and what do you do about that? Do, do you just kind of resume, just to kind of decide, oh, well, I'm the minority person, and it's, I'm not going to take this any further? Or are there strategies that you've learned to help bring people over to your side of the, of the aisle? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, I think it's also important to, to, when I'm answering your question, to point out that the parties themselves are not uniform in their thought process. There are many times when moderate Republicans or rhinos, as people who are more conservative like to call us, 
and the moderate Democrats, who I guess they call dinos now, are more aligned in our thinking than either end of the spectrum, the conservative or the progressive spectrum. There are many times when I disagree, when I go to my caucus with my minority party members where we disagree. Half of us think one thing and half of us think the other. Um, so the disagreement on policy happens both between the parties and inside the parties in terms of directions of things. Um, you know, I, and again, you know, I never used to be, talk about being a Republican because I really don't care about labels <laughs> until President Trump was elected. And then I thought it was important to talk about being a Republican because I wanted people to understand that one person does not define a party, uh, that there are many different um, facets of it. Um, but, uh, you know, an example of where I, I disagreed with something, um, I did not like the minimum wage bill that went. I am all for improving people's um, ability to earn. I think that just arbitrarily <laughs> moving a number every so often to increase it doesn't do anything to give that individual their own um, education or skills to improve their own lot in life. It basically says, you know, every couple of years we might raise this number and then you'll get something more. I would much prefer to put significant funding into ensuring um, people have the opportunity to uh, improve their own skills and their own education so that they have um, their own ability to affect the path in life that they want to take and their earnings potential. Um, you know, I, I think you have to pick and choose your battles. There are times when I disagree with something and I will just vote in the opposite. You know, I won't vote to support something, but I don't feel the need to get up and, you know, speak on it. Um, there are other times where I feel passionately about something and I think it's my responsibility to stand up and to speak on it and to present a different point of view. Um, but again, you know, my colleagues know that if they come to me, whether or not I agree with them or disagree with them, the tone and tenor of the conversation and what I will say to them, regardless <clears throat> whether it's a, you know, a, a first year member in the legislature or it's the speaker asking me something, you're gonna get the same answer from me. I'm gonna provide you the same perspective that I have. And I think that, you know, I'm a big believer in life that you either define yourself or you get defined. And when I came to Beacon Hill, I wanted to make sure that I defined myself, that who I was was going to have the opportunity to be illustrated. Um, and so I, I sought out opportunities where I could do that. Um, the marijuana question was actually a great opportunity for me, even though I'm dismayed that it passed because I didn't like the bill as written. Um, it gave me an opportunity to illustrate to my colleagues my bipartisan nature and my wanting to collaborate and to being an advocate both inside mm -hmm. the state house and outside the state house. Um, uh, so, um, but I think you know the, I have colleagues who feel the need to always stand up and speak and always present an opposing view. And after a period of time, you just stop listening altogether because you just don't want to hear it anymore. People who use their voice in a bit more of a selective way tend to have that voice magnified and be heard better when they are using it. More questions from the audience. Hi. I, too, want to thank you both and really, really appreciate the emphasis you've both given to collaborative thinking and work together and uh, listening. That said, I'm going to go right for the jugular, I think. <laughs> My area is in reproductive health and women's health more generally. And I, I want you, especially you, Rep. Kane, to see if you might speak to us specifically of your experience, either yourself or you've watched your colleagues attempt a collaborative conversation, dialogue, approach to legislation that is about sexual health, and I'll include abortion in that. There are two bills right now, as you well know, the Roe Act, which is more about abortion, the Healthy Youth Act, which is before your committee any minute now again. And these are such hot button issues where facts and values are both at play, and sometimes I'll expose my bias, it's hard to find the public health evidence and facts to support 
um, oppressing, well, um, restricting um, people's choices about and, inf and access to knowledge about uh, reproduction. Sure. So um, I am politically pro-choice. I believe that it's a woman's rights to choose. I'm personally pro-life. I don't think I could make that choice, but I, that is what I think being pro-choice allows for, that every woman can make their own choice about what is right for them. Um, there are aspects of the, the Roe bill, as it's termed, um, that I am not in love with, um, and, and one of that is altering the consent for young women. Um, that piece concerns me as a mother. Um, but I, I think that you actually have seen on Beacon Hill the last number of years uh, strong bipartisan support for a number of efforts that we have done to ensure that women's reproductive rights are held, um, whether it is uh, passing bills to ensure free access to contraception, um, to um, also you know, working across uh, the bipartisan lines to ensure that if there's anything that's going to inflict on the, the current law of the land, that we um, take that on. The current uh, row bills that are there um, go further than some of us would like to. I know the governor has always already said he's not uh, inclined to support it. But you know, I have every confidence that um, the legislature will be deliberative on it and that the speaker will continue to do what he's done on many things, which is to ensure that all voices are heard um, as it's moving forward. I've met with uh, many people on those bills, including Planned Parenthood and NARAL, and again, uh, have you know, voiced what my concerns are with it. Uh, and they've been very respectful and very open to that as well. And I think that, you know, as I said to you earlier at the end of the day, the speaker can bring up any bill at any time that he chooses to. I often find it funny sometimes that the criticism comes to the Republicans in the House, the 32 of us, as somehow being the people to hold things up. We cannot hold anything up. Uh, we have little to no power. What power we do have is actually because uh, the Speaker of the House has ensured that we have a voice on things, but ultimately, um, whether or not those bills come up and what they look like when they come up is completely up to the Democratic majority and whether they pass is completely up to the Democratic majority. So I personally will make a decision on it when I see the final language. One of the things that a lot of people don't understand is when you file bills, you, file, you write it, you file it, or somebody writes it and you file it, it goes to committee. The committee can change that bill in any way that they want. The bill can come out of committee and go to another committee, can go to Ways and Means. Those committees can change the bill any way they want. The bill can come to the floor. You can amend that bill up and down all day long and can change it any way you want before you are asked to take your actual final vote on the bill. And so what I tell people on particularly complicated or complex bills, that oftentimes I'm going to hold back on my final decision on whether to support it until I see the actual legislation, but I will articulate clearly where I stand on bills that exist, what's in them now, and whether or not I'm supportive or not supportive or something, or what my concerns are. And I think that that's my responsibility. Um, and so, you know, I think unfortunately sometimes people see the name of a bill and they, similar to the ballot question, you know, do you think marijuana should be legalized? Do you think adults should be able to use it? It's a very simple question. It's easy to answer that yes or no. What's not easy to understand is potentially all the implementation or underlying questions that are part of it. And that's what legislators have to do. There are many times when I could be 5149 on a bill trying to go back and forth to decide do the, the, the pieces that I like outweigh the pieces that concern me. Those are decisions we have to make a lot of times as legislators. Um, there's not a lot that's just a black and white question, but I do appreciate your question. Um, I think uh, ensuring a woman's right to choose is very important. I do think there's elements of that bill um, that I'm still not 100% on. Yep. Mm -hmm. Hello. Um, so I guess this is a question that requires a little problem solving, and I kind of want to get more insight on what the middle ground or middle point is for both of you. 
So from what I heard and what you guys shared, which thank you for sharing, a lot of the um, ideas or concepts or the way you guys conceptualize things is um, what's, I guess, not necessarily most profitable, but what's gonna be best in terms of expenditures, right? So like, what's gonna be the most that we can get without having to overspend, spe specifically within government programs and whatnot. Then I guess the side of the story that you guys don't necessarily hear as often is which is taught in our classrooms is that all these health inequities and disparities are caused by systemic issues. So where, where do you find the middle point, that bridge between talking about someone's access to public health as a numerical value versus talking about it as a systemic issue? Where is that middle ground for you guys? Could you elaborate a little? I'm not sure I understand the question completely. Yeah, sure. So I think my question is... Maybe you give an example of what you're looking for. Well, I don't know what I'm looking for. I think that that's the issue, right? That we oftentimes you. are in one side of the argument versus a middle side of the argument. I think you guys both expressed that one thing you wish would happen more often is that we would meet in the middle and have conversations that were both, um, I guess, feasible buy-ins for both sides of the argument. I think that on one side, we have a lot of people saying, you know, what's gonna be most, most bang for our buck? What are we gonna get? How are we gonna create programs that are really gonna allow us to not overspend, but also have impact? And then we have another side of the conversation that says, well, we need to dismantle all these systemic issues that are, are causing these disparities so and inequities. So what would be a systemic issue like? Um, so, for instance, let's say, for example, education systems, right? The way they're, ser they're set up, there's certain marginalized groups that are going to have access to education systems that are going to propel them to more profitable futures versus others that don't. Mm -hmm. And that also has to do with the amount that's being put towards funding and spending in specific education systems, public slash private or whatever the case may be. So mm -hmm. I guess where's the middle ground of that conversation? So I guess, you know, I don't start from the premise that those two things are mutually exclusive and you have to meet in the middle. Um, there are many times where, um, there are many times where there isn't an effort to say, let's, you know, find middle ground. I can meet you here if you can meet me there. They aren't thought of necessarily in that way. It is what would be the opportunity to solve this problem and how would we be able to do that and then there are choices you make along the way relative to um, whether it's revenue or other resources that exist there to do that. Um, you know, the education piece, that's one we've been working on for uh, four years now since the last, the Foundation Budget Review Commission work was done uh, that found deficiencies in the, in the amount of money that was going into special education, uh, retirement um, benefits the uh, English language learners and the, the low income student population. Those were underfunded at the state level and also at the local level. Um, the last session, uh, each branch, the House and the Senate passed something. They could not come to a conference committee bill, which was a negotiation between those two bills and it fell flat. This session, um, there are new bills that are filed and the two, uh, the Senate and the House Chair of the Education Committee are working very hard on it and I'm hopeful that we have something coming out soon. Um, I will tell you that uh, whatever bill end up moving forward, over 50% of the funding that will come from that will go into um, schools which are um, getting a disproportionate share relative to what they need um, to ensure that they're getting enough funding to make them similar with other communities, other local uh, areas where they have more funding available at the local <coughs> level to put into their schools than some communities do, particularly in our urban centers and gateway cities. Um, about 50% of the funds will go to that and the other 50% will be shared uh, by the other municipalities. Um, you know, ultimately we operate in an environment where uh, money is part of uh, the issue. And weighing all of the different and very important things that the government has to fund, to some extent, I mean, healthcare is one of the largest issues. Healthcare in Massachusetts is about, it's over 40 some percent of our state budget. 
that crowds out funding for many other things. That's why we spend an exponential amount of time trying to figure out how to keep down the expense side growth of healthcare. Because every time we can save something on healthcare, we have those dollars available to spend elsewhere in the state budget. Education is one of the primary buckets we seek to spend those dollars in. Um, but I just, I, I want to assure you that no one starts out saying, we're just going to put this much money towards it and whatever happens, happens. You know, it's a very deliberate process to understand what do we need to invest in order to get the return that we're hoping to do. Unfortunately, not all the time do we have the entire amount of money needed to hit the home run that we need to in some of the cases of disparity. Yeah, I would just say that it's often, uh, my experience has been that, you know, compromising and coming to the middle is often not the right thing to do. And I think in a deliberate problem solving, that's not where people normally end up because you get more information about the interests of both sides and you sometimes come to an agreement that's very much one side, one side or the other. So. It, you know, when somebody says something like split the difference or, you know, I offer $10, you offer 5 let's make it seven fifty. that's usually not a very good way to come to the best solution where, where the, uh, there's a cost to everything, of course, and people have to pay for whatever it is they want to do. But coming at it first from the cost standpoint, splitting the difference is uh, often not a very good approach. And to me, when I see that going on, it suggests to me that the, the, the people don't really understand what the other side is needs or wants, you know, what is their interest and how can that be best served? Remember the example I gave about the drafty window? I mean, I don't mean to trivialize some of these very uh, challenging problems, but, uh, you know, that's an example of, uh, of uh, solutions that they can come up that may be more optimal or more satisfactory to both sides is what I'm saying. If you just kind of constantly saying, you know, we need more money for the inner school cities, well, the guy on the other side has a, maybe, what is his interest or her interest? You need to understand that and he or her yours and uh, out of that kind of dialogue might, might come solutions. Please. Um, so I just want to uh, follow up on something you said about be proud of your perspective. Um, I think that it's tempting for New England Republicans to distance themselves from 35% of the electorate that they, that's like the Trumpian party. And I think as public health people, that 35% is widely exposed to public health issues like substance use and poverty and access to healthcare. So how, how should we frame it, people that are right-leaning? How do we frame being proud of what we think with being um, for people? excuse me, people that are ashamed of that part of their party or don't know how to bring them into the fold without alienating them when they're the people we need to serve the most? Well, I don't think you need to label yourself as one or, or the other. I don't label myself as a Republican or a Democrat, but I have a, I have a view on all the issues. And now I say that knowing that these issues are very complicated and many of them I may have a view on it might be totally wrong because I'm... Uh, um, poorly educated on the subject. Uh, you know, I might argue that compared to somebody who's 25, I'm quite a bit older than that, so I might have a little more experience with some of these issues, so maybe I don't need to have the same amount of knowledge. Maybe I can substitute experience, but yeah, I don't, I don't think you should label yourself. If you, you label yourself, you know, people will identify you with something that you don't want to be identified as. I think that that's what you said. If you have a view that you happen to be against abortion and you have good reason to be against abortion, you should explain it. Uh, and you, you, know, you should listen carefully to the people who say that they're uh, in favor of abortion. Uh, but I don't think you, you want to label yourself. And if you're, you know, you, you gave a perfect example. You said there are certain aspects of certain lines of political thought that you're not proud of, right? So, well, that just happens to be part of the platform. We happen to have two political parties in this country, and they, they each have a platform. That's where the, uh, those, those public health, those issues, remember the list I had with the red and the black? That came from political discussion of what Republicans believe in, what, what's the Democratic, what's the Republican platform, and you can read exactly what it says. Well, 
The list, there's a long list, right? Wasn't there like 30 things on the list? It's, it's very, I don't think you'd find any one person who agreed with one side of the column all the way down. And if you're dealing with people who uh, are resentful that you happen to have one, you know, one particular litmus test that you're not passing, you should just explain to them how narrow-minded they are. I think it's important to remember, and I, I do think the red and the C and blue is a bit misleading, because you should have a, a red smaller bubble in Massachusetts, and then you should have a blue bubble that's a little bit bigger, and then you should have the largest bubble, which is the unenrolled voters. The majority of people in Massachusetts and the majority of people in this country are unenrolled. They're, they're choosing, um, which I think is great, to be able to look at the person, not the party. It doesn't mean people who are Democrats always vote for Democrats. It doesn't mean Republicans always vote for Republicans. Um, I can personally attest to that. Um, but I think that um, more and more people are moving to be unenrolled because they want that freedom and flexibility and they want to be able to define, here's my own belief system. I'm not going to attach to that because I'm not really comfortable with all of that and I'm not really comfortable with all of that. So I'm just going to pick and choose and I'm going to be myself. And I think that's great. Um, you know, I, the, the Mass GOP right now is, is undertaking an effort to enroll more people in the Republican Party. I don't care how many people are registered Republican. I care how many people are voting for good Republican candidates who um, I would support because I think they have the tone and tenor and the ability to look at things in a constructive manner. Um, in my district, uh, in my first re-election effort, uh, Congressman Jim McGovern, who's a very progressive Democrat, serves um, the 2nd Worcester District, he's my congressman, um, he got about 75% of the vote in my district and I got about 75% of my vote in the district. That means that there's probably a good 50 to 60% of people there that were choosing to vote for both of us. They weren't looking at a letter after our name. They were making a decision based on how they felt that we were serving them and, and performing our duties. And I think that's what everybody should do. I think that that's how you should evaluate people. And I think that whatever your own belief system is, have the strength and the conviction in it. You don't need to be wed to all of some party's platform. I don't even know what's in our party's platform. I've never read the party platform for the, because I think what Bob put up earlier, sort of the, the limited government, the personal freedom, that's how I think about things. And unfortunately, we're still in an environment where we have two major parties, despite the fact that we have a, the majority of people unenrolled. That's the construct by which we run. Um, I identify um, as a moderate Northeast Republican. My hero growing up was Margaret Chase Smith, who was a moderate Republican, first woman to serve in the US House and, and in the US Senate. Um, she was a great, she was a maverick. Um, I, you know, sort of modeled my own thinking in terms of what I believed she might have thought on issues of this day. Um, but I don't, I'm not wed to any one person or any party platform. I want people to evaluate me, Hannah Kane, the candidate, as for what I've done um, and what I stand for myself. And I think that as individuals, you should all have the same right to do that as well. Thank you so much to our two speakers. Thank you to all of you for joining us today and for staying a little bit long while we could answer these fascinating questions. I hope that you'll keep the conversation going and we remain your humble servants if you have questions for us. Thank you very much.